a online live chat Philoxenia in our virtual meeting room now that uh, the Kreisky Forum cannot host physically all our guests. Uh, my guest today is Eva Ilus. She is a professor for sociology at two universities. One is the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in, Sciences in Paris, and the other one is Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Welcome, Eva, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tessa. I'm very happy, actually, to be here. That's wonderful. Um, we, the, the way we were thinking to conduct our online chat, which we have to limit strictly to one hour, is to uh, have a conversation between Eva and me at the beginning and then open up for questions. I hope that we can get uh, lots of questions in. Uh, if you do have a question among the participants uh, of this um, virtual uh, chat, please notify us because uh, Natalie, who is the brain of technology sitting in Vienna, will then uh, put you, you know, sort of uh, open, unmute, unmute you when your time has come to ask your question. I hope that this works. And um, let's just go straight in. To explain a little bit more, I think Eva, you are a celebrity in the international parkour of intellectual thinking about uh, sociology in the times of uh, capitalism. You have done a very important work on how uh, love hurts, how love ends, and what it all has to do with the context of how capitalism transforms our feelings, our relationships. Um, I am looking at these uh, last three months that have been such a challenge for every individual worldwide, wherever the crisis hit. And it changed so much of our ideas, not only of our private space, but also of our public space. And I hope we can go and discuss a few of these developments and what you think about it. Uh, especially in uh, the end of love, uh, you described how capitalism transformed our emotional and romantic life. And we had the feeling capitalism is taking over our, you know, it's, it's uh, our love doesn't belong to us anymore. It's part of the capitalist system. But now in the last three months, we have learned how important community actually is how much better equipped countries were to deal with the corona crisis that had strong social and health systems run by a state. And so I wonder somehow if capitalism is under review now and love is coming back to us. Oh, wow, well, that would be huge statements that I would not be able to, uh, to make. Um... So, I mean, I think there are two parts to your question. One is uh, what will happen to capitalism and second, what will happen to love, uh, which are what I call crystal ball questions to which I often don't have a response. Um, I, I, look, I mean, first of all, I don't know. I, I think to be honest, one needs to say that one does not know. Um, it is interesting to notice that for many years now, the Green Movement has tried to stop um, productivity, and it has been quite impossible. Um, and in actually uh, a matter of, you know, metaphorically, I want to say, a seconds, a question of seconds, metaphorically seconds, productivity, capitalist productivity had no problem, in fact, stopping uh, almost entirely, almost entirely. Um, because there was a virus which up until now has killed, you know, not even half a million people, which is not to say that whoever died is tragic, but it has probably, uh, it's still, these are much, much lower figures than, for example, the Hong Kong epidemics in 1968, 69, or it's a much less tra tragic figure than what we would expect will happen if there are se severe shortages of water, for example, as a result of global warming. 
so I think the first, for me, the first lesson to learn is, you know, for, from the standpoint of a liberal, social, democratic, green politics, there is a question to ask here. Why was it so incredibly difficult to get um, anything to happen um, when we have a massive catastrophe, in fact, um, you know, threatening us, when it was, in fact, quite easy to shut down everything uh, for a virus? I think that's a question that should remain. And, and so to answer your, your question, I think this is going to be a learning process. It, we have learned from it that we can do it. If there is, a, um, but we can do it, it seems, only on condition that it is defined as an emergency. And for some reason, the uh, um, um, climate catastrophe is not yet defined as an emergency. So I think what is going to change is um, this, the, uh, the realization that if countries want it, they can do it. We're going to put a lot of pressure uh, on uh, state and corporation, I think, to act in, with the same vigor and energy that they have uh, acted on for this uh, crisis. Then I think that, you know, um, what we can see are two conflicting tendencies. One is an enormous reinforcement of the, um, of, you know, techno capitalism of the, you know, Amazon and Google and uh, Facebook and Netflix. These companies uh, double, triple, quadrupled their uh, um, profits in uh, this short time and sent us or, or uh, sent us home or, or exploited the fact we were at home and we relied on them very uh, heavily. So we have on the one hand the extraordinary expansion uh, or increasing power of those already extremely powerful industries. But I think we're going to see uh, also a demand that corporations participate much more in a kind of, you know, social solidarity in order to restore uh, some uh, economic um, um, some economic activity. So I, I so 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 I think you have different things happening at the same time. Um, I mean, the, the critique. Uh, um on neoliberal states that they were so clearly not able to provide protection for its citizens, I think should really have also a strong impact because the uh, feeling of insecurity uh, that people suddenly had because they didn't know in uh, places here in London where we for weeks did not know if we would be able to uh, go to hospital in case that something happened because they were so ill-equipped after 10 years of being under austerity programs. Um, I think this should sort of point to the future how important it is to be aware and to be prepared. Don't you think that this will be one of these lessons that people draw? That neoliberalism and populist regimes are actually good weather uh, uh, regimes more than crisis managers. Hmm. That's interesting what you're saying. I, I would tend to agree. In fact, um, I think the most neoliberal leaders in the world are the ones who fared the worst. Uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, Johnson, uh, Boris, uh, you know, if I can think, I think, and and Italy, because the North uh, um, Italian industrial region was the one who actually forced for quite a while the workers to go and work. And what these leaders have in common, so, so it took for them a long time to react to the crisis. And we know that time was of the essence because uh, you really needed to react quickly in order to prevent the um, spread of the virus. I think, you know, and Boris Johnson was very uh, upfront about it. And Bolsonaro was the most, I think, charmingly disarming about it. They all, you know, they said things like, oh, well, the strongest will survive. Uh, the fittest will survive. So in a way, as if biological Darwinism was uh, reflecting or mirroring uh, their social Darwinism, that is, 
let the fittest be um, uh, uh, the strongest one uh, socially. So for sure, the neoliberal leaders are the ones, I think, who fared the worst. Um, but this is slightly different from your question because your question was about, I think, uh, the, the, the state. And I think you're absolutely right because a neoliberal state, I think, for me, one of its key characteristics is that its view increase, it views increasingly its role as facilitating economic exchange and increasing the volume of economic uh, transactions and favoring, in fact, the strong economic actors. That, for me, is a key feature of the, the neoliberal state. Now, um, many of the people who are now dealing with uh, or entering politics are businessmen. You know, Trump, for example, is um, a, a very good example. Um, although I would not put him in the same category, Macron also is a businessman. But of course, I would not put him in the same category as Trump at all. Um, these people tend to think of management in terms of quick returns. They invest something, they, they, they tend to think of money uh, and management in terms of investment, and they tend to think in terms of quick investment. That's why, by the way, Trump uh, closed down when he went into office. He closed down the federal agency for the management of epidemics, even though people told him um, the, that the probability, that specialists thought that the probability of an epidemic was uh, quite high. Yeah. Uh, he closed it down because this is the, typically the kind of an agency that uh, makes no money. It just spends money on behalf of the public good. Of course, with, this, uh, uh, with the, the, the ultimate irony, which many of them had to deal with, which is that if you try to save um, on epidemics prevention, then you will, in fact, end up paying an economic for price uh, far, far, far higher. Um, so so um, the, the neoliberal state was absolutely unequipped. I think you are right. Unequipped both materially, but also in terms of um, how it was supposed to manage risk um, yes. I mean, what, what I always find also interesting is that um, autocrats uh, everywhere try to use the corona crisis immediately to further their political interests. So Netanyahu in Israel is one good example for someone who even tries to slip in uh, the annexation of parts of the West Bank while we are all busy looking somewhere else. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, is now pursuing a hard Brexit at the end of this year because he thinks the economic, um, the negative consequences can be just uh, declared a part of the corona package of uh, measures that he has to take. So, and of course, the worst example of all of them might be China and its grip on Hong Kong with new security laws. Um, is there something to, you know, is, is the corona crisis an opportunity for autocrats? I think any crisis is an opportunity uh, for autocrats. Um, and I um, like the notion that Naomi Klein developed of shock capitalism. This idea that when a country undergoes a severe shock, say an economic shock or of any kind, then you will immediately have the people, both in politics and in economics, who will use and seize their and, and, and grab whatever bounty there is to grab. There is nothing new about it, and uh, so so that's one thing I think. Uh, um, you know, and uh, Trump, for example, uh, you, you gave political uh, examples of uh, suspension of, um, you know, of liberty, for example, in China, or the fact that um, Netanyahu closed down the, uh, uh, the courts when the corona crisis started, 
or the fact that he's going to ignore the international law by uh, an extinction. But it's not only political, it's, uh, it's also economic. For example, uh, Trump, used, Trump and Kushner and Mitchell uh, uh, used the opportunity to pass um, 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 measures that will give enormous tax breaks to the richest, to themselves actually, to themselves. So that is no less, I think for me, a coup d'etat. That is no less an abuse, a very strong abuse of power. Uh, and, uh, and so, and the reason why is, I think, quite simple. Hobbes already anal analyzed it very lucidly. Fear, um, you, can, you can govern by fear. Fear is the best uh, ingredient for control and power. As soon as you instill fear in citizens, then the citizen will, citizens will almost always prefer to give up on their freedom rather than on, on their security. And here it was a crisis which uh, obviously put uh, into question their health. With some interesting exceptions, by the way, to what I say. One is the far right uh, reactions in America and in Germany to the lockdown. Uh, and their argument that they preferred, in fact, um, their freedom um, by opposing the orders of lockdown. This I find quite interesting because they uh, hook up and rejoin the extreme left. If you have on the extreme left philosopher like uh, Giorgio Agamben, who refused uh, in you know a few pieces he published, who refused the logic behind the lockdown, because for him it seemed that this lockdown proceeded from um, a state of emergency, which in fact suspended freedom. And Agamben goes further: we should never give up on freedom, no matter what the circumstances. Now, it's interesting that he was rejoined by the extreme right. So I'm, I'm not saying it uh, um, um, judgmentally. Uh, I'm, I'm observing it. I find it uh, quite um, interesting. Um, and the upper camp that emerged in front of that is the camp which includes both the right and the left, conventional right, conventional left, which I think... Um, um, adopted the, the view that the state should be animated by what we can call a sanitary reason, a sa and the sanitary reason which overpowers uh, the rest. And so, so I would, so, so I would say that yes, of course, it has been um, an occasion, a, a, a wonderful, marvelous occasion for authoritarian leaders to assert their rules. And you forgot to mention uh, Hungary, uh, yeah. where or Orban and, and Turkey also. And I think uh, in Egypt as well. I mean, um, I think, and, and Bolsonaro, of course, and Bolsonaro, I mean, you can, um, th there are quite a few leaders out there who really use this moment to suspend executive power and to, uh, assert their um, power um, by suspending even sometimes civil liberties. Um, that is uh, for sure, but at the same time, I think it raised some very um, interesting questions around this issue of freedom because um, at the same time that they did that, some of their supporters also opposed, like, Trump supporters, for example, I mean, Trump is anti-democratic, but some of his supporters oppose the lockdown in the name of the First Amendment, that is, in the name of their freedom to go to church, go shopping, go to work, etc. So, so a lot of our, I would say, traditional fault lines and categories became a bit troubled and blurred and scrambled. I mean, what I really like about these last three months that all these debates became so raw and 
so also the response. So you have the political response from governments to the crisis. And then you have the response of the populations. And as you rightly say, in America, it was especially extreme uh, with churches trying to open in, in, because they had the right to go to church and they thought that it was more important than to protect other people maybe to get sick. Uh, the demonstrations where the far left and the far right met in Germany, but also here in London, for example, the brother of Jeremy Corbyn went to the Hyde Park protests against the measures of social distancing, which was actually organized by a small right-wing group connected to the British Nationalist Party. So there was this strange coalition that people had. Uh, at the same hand, on the, on the same hand, what we see now uh, at the moment is huge anti-racist protests that are sweeping also Europe. Also, something happened in Minnesota, which is a kind of interesting phenomenon because it also means that apparently America still has quite a lot of soft power on its side so that we all react very strongly to something that happens in America. But it seems to me that there's such a, uh, the reaction is uh, very positive in the sense that it brings out solidarity, it brings out an anti-racist protest and it also means that the young generation that goes to demonstrate, also some of us that are older, are attacking the uh, question of inequality, which is the fundamental basis of um, what happened in Minnesota with George Floyd. So do you think that we can see also um, a, popular, a popular protest movement that is emerging here, which is quite positive actually, because it, it, it really sort of goes now to ask the question how we can tackle inequality better. Um, well, thank you. I didn't, I mean, I didn't think about your question. So of course there is a popular movement asking for more equality. I mean, I don't have to have an opinion about it. It's obvious that there is one. Um, so, but I think that the, um, these movements strikes me, or I think it's a question. I think they would not have happened. This is to connect back to our uh, previous discussion. I don't think they would have happened without the corona crisis, and not to this extent. Because, I mean, uh, for two reasons at least, maybe more. One is that, as we know, uh, minorities, ethnic minorities, paid the heaviest price in terms of uh, uh, death, um, uh, black people died disproportionately to their actual uh, number in the population. And they died, so I don't know if it was, uh, you know, if it is because, as some people said, they tend to be more overweight or to suffer more from uh, diabetes. But I, I tend to think that the sociological explanation is, the, is, is really the one, which is that they were the ones who were more, more likely to be exposed because they needed to go to work and they did not ha have the luxury of uh, working at home. So, and some of them, you know, started lacking basic things because they couldn't have a work. Many of them, you know, the, the state help and money was very slow in coming. And so, and, and many of them started feeling, uh, I mean, real distress. The way you feel distress in a time where uh, there is not much to eat. Um, and, and so I think the, the corona crisis had this effect of highlighting in a way that is more dramatic and more intense than normally the enormous disparity in the capacities not to live, but to survive. So it became a different issue. It became who can survive and who can't. And obviously it was not the poor African-American people who could survive. Survive. So I say survive because I think uh, um, th that the divide was, was there. It was a, a divide about, uh, about survival. So uh, I think that's uh, one of the reasons why these um, 
riots or protests could sp spread uh, so quickly and um, and could um, you know um, have such power. Of course, it also comes in the background of a horrific. I mean, I don't have another word. Probably there are other words, but the horrific presidency by the most grotesque president I have ever seen in my life lifetime of any leader has been completely grotesque. So I think there these two things probably explain it. The other thing which I find interesting that I haven't thought about it until you asked the question is that the corona crisis is the first planetary event of its kind. There it, there has never been an, a planetary of this of, it, of this type. That is where uh, five billion people uh, are under house arrest and where the person in Manhattan or India or Israel and or in Italy are actually leaving the same thing. They are undergoing the same. Uh, so, so for the first time there was a planetary event um, that um, made you realize in a way that we're all in this and that made you that made us realize we have uh, a shared humanity and a common destiny as a species as a species now this is what the greens have been saying in a way for 20 years or 30 years they, they try to make us think of ourselves not in terms of class or so, social class for example or but in terms of human species and i think First time we had an event that happened to us as a human species. And that I think might have been also the background to explain how, in fact, something that started in Minneapolis actually spread to the entire world because suddenly there is this awareness of, um, of us belonging to a single species. Well, it also has to do, of course, with the fact that racism exists uh, in every country. Um, it's just that I was astonished, for example, in Vienna, the protests, uh, the I can't breathe protests were really, really big. Uh, uh, and, um, and it's not the, the, the core uh, issue in, in a country, usually, because there, you know, there are other problems in Austria that might emotionalize people even more but it is was a sign as you say that we are in a global um ex, sort of experiment uh, which brings out also these things that you have a global solidarity and that you think together about problems and and you can compare them and maybe we will in the future now not be so focused on economic growth but also about the question how we can provide better welfare for the majority of the citizens Oh, well, let's see about that. Let's see. I um, have full faith in many corporations that they will go back to business as usual uh, very quickly. But I might, you know, some might say I'm cynical, but I, I, I demand to see my cynicism disproved. But if you look, for example, at um, opinion polls about universal basic income, and there is actually a, quite a majority for people who are asking for that. And um, it was always sort of a little bit, uh, people were looking down at this concept because how can you finance something and how can you give benefits to people who are lazy and sit at home or whatever these arguments were about. And now we learn that actually people who often uh, earn very little, have very, very important jobs to do that actually keep us out of trouble. So all this debate about a new evaluation of the value of, of work, of jobs, of um, payment uh, for them, and how we can provide a, a network in times of crisis, which makes it possible for people not to go hungry and actually fall into poverty if in an economic crisis, jobs get lost. So all this, I have the feeling, brought up so much new thinking and it might be also, especially from the young generation, uh, um, a push to take these 
ideas seriously um, and really seriously discuss a universal basic income. So, um, yeah, you know, I, um, I, I wrote myself um, a piece where I mentioned this um, inversion of values, especially in the realm of work, where what we witnessed is indeed uh, an inversion of the uh, pyramid or scale of prestige we normally attribute because uh, suddenly the hedge fund managers the and the you know the people who work in uh, pr public relations or um or people who work in advertising what um, the anthropologist uh, graber calls um, not for all of what i mentioned but for some of them he calls them bullshit jobs that is jobs that you know um if they disappeared no one would feel the difference um and we were able to make the difference very quickly between these jobs and jobs like uh being a doctor being a nurse uh being a, a truck driver cleaning the the street uh working in a supermarket offloading and uploading uh food in trucks all of these, I, and I like very much the ways in which the, in English they um, um, uh, captured these professions. They said they called them the essentials. That's how they called them during the crisis, the essentials. And of course, the essentials means that lots of people became really inessential. And um, so I completely agree that we experienced that. Now, the question is, whether we're going to carry this understanding with us after the crisis, ha, huh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And yesterday there was, or or today, I don't remember, in the New York Times, I saw um, a piece on uh, many hospitals, many hospitals, having furloughed many of their uh, personnel, doctors and nurses, uh, furloughed or um, um, or fired. dismissed, fired, while the um, administration of hospitals um, earned millions and millions in bonuses during this period. We're not. I'm talking about now, uh, and so you can look at the the piece in the New York Times. So that you know to change these fundamental structure uh, will take much more, I think. It will take much more. It will also take on the part of the protesters now an act of memory. I mean, we will need to remember to, put, to have this collective learning and carry it through to the post-crisis uh, period. I mean, one of these areas of where we will need a lot of collective memory later is how um, corona lockdown affected our private lives so at the beginning especially i had a lot of conversations like everyone with other uh, friends of mine who said they are sitting at home they have to work they have kids at home and they have to cook for the whole family because you know everyone expects uh, breakfast lunch and dinner and um I, and people were really scared that they found themselves back in the 50s and that the kitchen was the place where women spend a lot of time. And I thought maybe it also will produce a new type of feminism that, you know, young women who maybe thought feminism is a thing of the last generation, we don't need that anymore, we are equal, see how quickly you come back to uh, how difficult it is also to get out of traditions in traditional also relationships you know there are a lot of families where there is not mama papa and children but in these kind of more classic uh, heterosexual classic nuclear families i think a lot of this maybe also will lead to women really pushing for more uh, schools for the whole day that children are fed in schools at lunch which in austria is still not the case in many, many cases. And to sort of come up with new concepts where a lot of the housework is more equally distributed. So a new type of feminism, do we have any chances for that? Oh, wow, um, a new type of feminism. Um, 
you know, again, I don't have a real crystal ball. I don't think the crisis is big enough. Uh, I think we ha have, a, I mean, in the all type of feminism, we have enough to do already. Um, I don't, the critique of the home, for example, uh, can be found in Betty Friedan's um, 1967, Feminine Mystique. It is a scathing critique of the home and it's a scathing dem demythologization of what the home is supposed to be like. And so for me, I think what this uh, crisis has done is to show that home is not so sweet. You know, there's this view of home, sweet home. Um, or, or more exactly, I think a home without a public sphere out there is totally oppressive. And the reason why it was uh, bearable was because a great deal of the public sphere actually entered the home. But just think of how much we need the public sphere to have a home. We need the school. Many parents, you know, uh, pulled their hair because they had no schools anymore. Um, um, we need, and often men and women need separate spheres of work to, because first of all, apartments, modern apartments are often small. They are not conceived as places in which people stay all the time. They are mm. typically, they were typically built um, as places in which people meet in the evening. And, and, um, and, and so homes are bearable in a way only if people go out in the public sphere of work and also of leisure. Uh, you know, we've, we've become dependent on both work and leisure, but, and there is a big but that's important to emphasize, the um, corona crisis has highlighted the fact that we are increasingly going towards a world that is going to happen in the home in that this is the interest of the big screen companies, Google, Facebook, etc. And, you know, Facebook announced just about, I think, a week or 10 days ago, Facebook announced as a result of the crisis that many of its uh, workers were not coming back and that they discovered the great joys of, uh, of work at home, by which, you know, we have to understand that they discovered, in fact, that it could be much cheaper for yeah. the same, for, uh, uh, for the same productivity. That's actually what they uh, discovered. And I think more and more um, companies are going to discover that. And we are more and more going towards, um, if, you know, if this crisis is any reflection of tendencies that were inscribed already and that might accentuate and accelerate. What we have discovered is that we're going to, you know, toward the world in which we're going to be fragmented, highly fragmented and highly privatized, where both work and leisure become highly privatized. This is exactly the vision that um, Adorno or Primer and Hannah Arendt had viewed as the conditions for creating totalitarian societies because people are completely isolated and being isolated, they cannot really create a social bond. Now, to go back to the protests, what was marvelous about it is to see that this logic collapsed. It, it was not able to hold, but it was not able to hold because many people were hungry and were mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. I think if people were not hungry and were not dying, it would have held. Um, so I think we should, um, you know, after the, 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 the pandemic is over and the health issue is, is resolved, I think we should really think carefully about this intense privatization of social life, which um, is, not, uh, is not good news, in my opinion. We need a home, we need a world, a public world, for us to have a private home. It's... Definitely one point that was already so it's a, a trend since the internet allowed people to work from home also before the corona crisis and more and more we had the feeling that there's a lot of precarious uh, jobs that people work uh, in independent um, contracts 
from their home office and um, are nearing working conditions that people had in the 19th century before sort of collective um, working uh, contract conditions were established by and called for by unions and fought for by social movements. Um, so I wonder if this is, you know, this is a trend that we have to deal with in any case, because this is what uh, remote work through internet means allows us to do. But the question is if now the coronavirus has shown what really the danger is, not only to people who are in these precarious jobs, but actually, as you say, to everyone. You know, it has also shown now to male uh, bank managers or to female leaders of, uh, of, of big uh, companies that they have to manage a life which is really uh, socially challenged if it is confined to the home. And maybe this will lead also to a, a rethink of um, how much um, private and how much public uh, connection uh, homes with ho home needs. I agree with everything you said. I didn't see a question. I see a, a wonderful comment with which I entirely agree. Yes, um, you know, the home gives, it's not so easy because the home gives the illusion uh, or not so much the illusion of freedom. I mean, when you are at home, you do not have the personal relationship with a boss who can be sometimes uh, abusive and or unpleasant. And so the home gives you uh, uh, gives you that sense of freedom which has been cultivated on the whole by our modern societies. But it is a freedom that is highly individualized and highly fragmentary. Uh, and it's also, I say, it's an illusion of freedom because we are still highly dependent. We are in fact more and more dependent on, on all those technologies, which in fact also surveil us from within our home. Um, so the processes of surveillance are increasing, not decreasing. That is true. I think we should maybe see what questions we have. Natalie, how can we do that? Are you in charge? Can you release one of the questions to Eva? Uh, so far, there are no hands raised. Are there any questions? Please raise your hand. I have, I have one here on the chat. Shall I read it? Oh, just a second. There are two questions. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, my name is Kurt Bayer. I have a question on this re-evaluation of jobs, you know, essential jobs and their, their remuneration, essentially. You would think on the surface, of course, that countries which have strong labor union representation might be able to carry this over to the after COVID uh, situation. However, however, the reality is that, uh, I know at least about the Austrian case, that like uh, supermarket cashiers and people working there uh, have always been sidelined essentially by the Austrian labor movement and some of these female low paid jobs actually don't really figure very strongly in the very male dominated labor, move, labor movement in Austria. But uh, if anybody can help, I guess, uh, the low paid essentials to really get a little bit more remuneration. It can be only the labor unions because individual work contracts will not go there. Eva, could you say something about that? Um, I, I mean, I agree. I, you know, honestly, I'm not a specialist of, in fact, any of the issues we raised today. I write about other things uh, or research other things. I think I completely agree, but I think the uh, you know, the labor unions is the classic um, uh, locus for negotiating uh, salary rise. I think what 
I would like to see uh, after this or already now, I, I, I would really like if companies and corporations viewed themselves as responsible as well for pulling together, for bringing back people uh, from the hell of unemployment and uh, for raising um, people from abject poverty to minimum uh, wage. Um, so, um, so, you know, I haven't thought yet, uh, I don't have a program yet about these things. Um, but I, I, would, I would be much happier if it was not only the um, problem of trade unions, but rather if it became some, somewhat something of a more general issue. You know, corporations benefit from a lot of public goods such as education, such as uh, infrastructure. Um, and they, in fact, this is one of the reasons why they have been able to um, create or to enrich themselves uh, in such an astronomical way. It is because on the one hand, they enjoy public goods that are paid by uh, the um, ordinary citizens. And on the other hand, have a highly private conception of what to do with their profits. I think, you know, what I would want is to demand very forcefully that corporations reinvest a great deal of their profits into rebuilding uh, society and its economy. Thank you, Kurt. Do we have another uh, live question? Ah, uh -huh. hello, Alex. Ah, hello. So uh, it's, uh, thank you for getting the opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, I was very interested in, 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 in all the things you said. And I think they, they were really thought, thoughtful and thought provoking. But I'd, thank like, you so to, much. I'd like to ask you, Professor Ivos, to, to kind of uh, uh, probe a little bit one thing that you mentioned. And that was, on the one hand, these, these, the green movement, which, which was emphasizing a common kind of humanity that needs to get its, you know, that needs to, we're all affected, we all have to do things together. But on the other hand, you see that many of the movements of the last, of the last years have been movements that were particularly focused on one, on one section of that humanity. So it's, it's Black Lives Matter, it's Me Too, um, it's, uh, so, so how do, do you see this in some way as a, uh, as a danger and a dichotomy, or do you see this as uh, naturally flowing into each other and not, not being an, an issue that can become a problem? Thank you for the wonderful question. I, I don't, you know, I don't have a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a big question. I, I would have to really think about it. Um, but you know, what happened with the Black Lives Matter is a, um, actually, you know, I used to be skeptical or not skeptical, but very ambivalent towards identity politics thinking that it had uh, um, created the crisis of relationship between the left and the working classes yes. and thinking that it had uh, created a huge void which was more easily filled by populist leaders because the left no longer wanted to represent or to yeah or ne ne it no longer felt that it could represent the interests or the worldviews of the working classes. That has been one of the major changes, I think, that happened in the left for the last uh, three or four decades. And so, so that's why I was for quite a while quite ambivalent about identity politics, especially given that populism uh, seemed to have filled that void. 
Um, at the same time, you know, when you uh, see movements like Black Lives Matter, you understand that, in fact, the cause of racism is also the cause of the poor and the working class to, to a great extent. Because in, ma in many, many countries now, a great deal of what was the former, what were the former uh, working class jobs are now actually done by immigrants or people of color. And so there is a huge overlap today between, uh, uh, between the, the cause of, uh, um, of racialized, as we say in French, uh, people and, uh, and the defense of the working class. It's not, I don't think it is, uh, it always overlaps, but I think in this case it does. Uh, it did overlap and that's, that's the power of it. I think that's why, um, um, and what, what is more striking is that many white people joined their uh, protests. That's what's new. What is new is that it is no longer a black movement, but it seems to become a movement that is uh, uh, much wider. I think it's wider because the crisis again has enabled to understand that um, it is also that these people are made highly vulnerable also because of their socioeconomic condition. Now, so to your question, does this contradict uh, the agenda, an agenda in which we, as a, um, you know, even as much as we have limited resources of time and attention, it does, it does contradict. Uh, so that's why I think the left should be very careful. You know, I think there is room for two types of left. One that worries about the human species, what I called before the future of the human species and what I would call also the politics of survival that, that is both biological and uh, ecological on the one hand and a uh, highly social left being uh, aware that these two lefts must make alliances. They must not uh, fragment or undermine each other as the left is so good about doing. There is nothing like the left to undermine itself or to undermine anybody who is slightly on its left or slightly on its right. So I think that, um, I think there is room for these two lefts as long as um, we can think of, uh, as, as long as we keep in mind um, the, uh, um, over, the overarching importance of alliances in critical junctures and moments. I actually think also that the, uh, the fact that the slogan of this spring has become, of the protest have become, I can't breathe, which brings together the um, anti-racist uh, protests with the virus where people couldn't breathe, which then affects all of us and is a universal issue that doesn't only affect uh, a specific group. I think it's not by accident that this is happening. Very nice. Um, I have another question here um, from Gerhard. Yeah, yeah. I'm Gerhard, sorry. Um, yeah. I, I know. Um, I can take I only know. one more question and then I have to leave. I'm, I'm so yes. sorry, I have another Zoom um, in really Absolutely. a few minutes. Let's see if we can quickly get another question in. Is there one, uh, Natalie, on the... No on more your, questions. Okay. I have one here from Gertraud saying, uh, coming back to the point of love, apparently the consequence of home sweet home is an increase of divorce which is something which will become apparent now in the weeks after the lockdown is uh, lifted everywhere. Can you comment on that and elaborate on that? Um, well, in a way, I, did, I commented already. I think the homes are tolerable for many couples only if they contain the possibility of having different uh, paths during the day. And um, gender roles came to the full force, uh, uh, domestic violence, increased tremendously. And that is because also men and women came back to their traditional role vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the home. What it showed in fact, what the 
it showed that uh, women are still overwhelmingly responsible for um, domestic tasks. Uh, and I, I, I'm, as much as I would love to stay I more, know, I'm so we have sorry. a very clear plan, and it's also really true that um, 55 minutes on Zoom are like three hours in real uh, time. So it's much more complicated to focus and concentrate looking into a camera. I wanted to thank you very, very much, Eva, to take this time for us. Thank and, you. Um, and also thank everyone who came in and listened to us. This talk will be a Falter Radio podcast um, and uh, it will also be uh, possible to listen to it at the Bruno Kreisky website um, and on Facebook. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Goodbye. And bye. -bye. bye.